Hello everyone. Uh, thanks for joining today's session. Um, today we'll be advanced building in Ad Creator. My name is Julio. I'm a product specialist. If you guys have any questions throughout um, the duration of this webinar, feel free to drop that question into uh, the chat panel. Right now I have a question about whether these um, webinars are recorded and shared. Yes, they are shareable. Um, just reach out to us, support at seltzer.com and uh, request the webinar. Otherwise, from time to time, we'll put this up on our insights page, which you can see right now is the page that I'm currently at. So seltzer.com slash insights under the webinar section. You can see we have pre-recorded webinars and uh, we do our best to update here. So feel free to check here or just reach out to us, support at seltzer.com and we'll share those recorded videos with you. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, today's session is 45 minutes. Uh, we'll be going over some advanced building techniques. Uh, specifically, we'll be going over the differences of event handlers between uh, the desktop and uh, touch devices like handset and tablet, as they have different event ha handlers. <clears throat> we'll also take a look at dynamic content. We'll take a deeper dive how to um, do uh, things such as conditions met, maybe trigger off, trigger off some animations there, and also um, you know, setting up placements and audience signals as well, since there are sometimes questions around that. So we'll do that. We'll really go over all the signals, and uh, I'll show you how easy it is to use dynamic content. Uh, we'll also do some fun animating, and I'll try and share some uh, tricks and tips along the way that I feel might be helpful, helpful for you. And we'll also, at the end, look at um, how to set up a reveal unit. So as you can see, I have a lot of tabs open. So let's just go ahead and get started. So first, just to kind of go over how to set up um, a handset or a desktop ad. Uh, right now, I'm signed into my account. Uh, this is pretty um, rather you know, simple. You just go to your rich media display. You can see I also have an outstream and cross screen selection here. Uh, these will be available shortly. These are new features. Uh, we have our outstream video editor, which is really great for editing video. And we also have our cross screen product, which will allow us to build ads that will run across um, multiple devices, such as you know, a single ad that can run on handset, tablet, or desktop. So for now, we have our, our kind of two standard selections, which is like display, which doesn't really have um, all of our components. It's more or less just a simplified version of building ads. So this would be like you know, standard animations and such. Uh, the Rich Media Display is really has all of our robust features built in. So this is what everyone's pretty much using. So you would just hit Next, and uh, you would choose the type of ad format. Like, for example, I could choose Interstitial. gives you kind of a visual display of what that looks like. And then you can hit Next, and you can see we can now choose a phone or a tablet device. So Desktop is grayed out for Interstitial. As you know, uh, we don't run Interstitials on uh, Desktop. But uh, if we were to hop back, and go to, for example, a banner, obviously then now these are all available to us. So if I were to um, back up a bit more, um, well, actually, let's go ahead and move forward and I'll show you because, well, as you know, selecting between the devices is as simple as this, but once you have the units built out, like what are the key differences that you can expect, right? So when we're looking, I have two units here that are open. Here is a desktop unit. And here is my mobile unit. So there are obviously um, you know, some difference in features of what's available to you. Uh, if you open up your components and you can see, you know, uh, some of them are, will be grayed out. So if you ever have like, uh, you're ever wondering why something is grayed out, whether it's even in like the analytics dashboard, you can just hover over it and it's gonna tell you specifically you know, why this uh, feature is not available. So that's really convenient. It's showing you that we're there with you while you're building, making sure you're not building something that's gonna break. So um, in this case, you know, input doesn't work for interscroller feature. So that, that works also the same with desktop. So in that case, you don't have to really worry too much about um, things that will break. We're kind of uh, limiting you based on what you have selected of what you want to build and the environment that it'll, it'll go into. So aside from like different features and stuff that may, may or may not work between the two different uh, types of uh, devices, what are we to expect when it comes to um, you know, building out um, events and actions? So I think that's the main key difference between a desktop and a uh, touch device, such as mobile or tablet, is what you're going to expect when you're um, dealing with animations and events. So if I were to do, let's just do like, for example, I'm do a new page. I'm going to open up components, 
I'm going to drag on a hotspot. So if we were to open up our events and actions, you would see the first event that's being offered to us is a tap event. So most things that you're uh, going to be selecting and uh, building with, they kind of know already its functionality. So since this is a hotspot, it knows like the first interaction you're probably going to use is going to be a tap event. So just for example, give you another example, I'll bring on like, let's say a swipey gallery. So this is obviously where you put all your different like, you know, images and such. So if we look on the events and actions panel, you'll see automatically the first event has already changed and it knows that this is a swipey component. So the first thing you're probably going to interact with is what happens when a user taps on a single panel. And as you know, if we look in the uh, info panel, there's multiple panels. You can add you know, additional panels as well, as many uh, Swipey products as you want. So we can also take a look at what other events are available for Swipey. So in this case, you have a panel in focus. So what would you like to do when specifically panel one is in focus? So you could do, for example, an animation. Uh, so when we hop over to the next item, you'll see since each item is unique to itself, that you could basically do different uh, events. So in this case, maybe I would do a different animation, right? And you can basically cater to each panel specifically uh, by what you're setting up in the events. And you can see we have an in focus and out of focus. So what happens when this panel comes in? Maybe a cool animation happens. And when that panel leaves focus, maybe those animations go away. And if a user taps on this specific uh, panel, maybe it's going to go to a specific URL for that panel or a different page in the unit, right? So I'm just kind of highlighting, give you a feel like we already know that whatever you have selected, the info panel is going to adjust itself, right? It's going to tell you about what you have selected. But also the events and actions are also going to adjust itself and tell you um, events that you can do with it that are more specific to it. So just keeping that in mind, if we look at our uh, handset unit, you can see when I select this uh, specific hotspot for this mobile unit, you can see I have a tap event and I also have a swipe, a press, and release. So these are kind of our standard events that would uh, happen when a user interacts with a hotspot here on a mobile unit. But you'll also see I have a mouse over and out that are currently grayed out. And the reason for that is because those are desktop specific um, events. So if we hop over to our desktop unit and we also select the hotspot and we go ahead and open up our events and actions, you can see now we have a click event. So not only do the specific features that you're interacting with or components know what you're most likely going to want to interact with, like for example, if I choose on the uh, stage here, I choose a page, it knows most likely the type of event that I want to use on a page is what happens when the, this page appears to you. Like how would you like to make the animations trigger off, right? And there's also different types of page appears. You can do a first appear, a before appear, and so forth. You can also have shake and, and so forth, but these are our handset uh, specific. So uh, just kind of giving you that feel that um, not only do the components, they're smart enough to tell you like what your first event is most likely going to be, uh, also between the different devices, it's smart enough to adjust those as well as you know, you could do some really cool hover events. Like what happens if um, a user is has their mouse hovering over this specific hotspot, maybe you want to trigger off some cool animations. Uh, but obviously, these hover states are not available on a mobile because you, you touch and interact with the mobile unit. You don't hover over it with a mouse. So um, with that in mind, uh, or if there's any questions about that, feel free to drop that in. I think that's pretty straightforward. I wanted to show you um, a couple examples of you know, just kind of playing around with that idea, uh, what you could do with a hover state, for example. So if I choose this button, it knows it's a button right here. So the first event it's going to give me is a click. Hey, I'm a button. What would you like to do when somebody clicks me, right? Uh, you also, since this is desktop, you have a mouse down and up position, since uh, those are uh, interactions that we're able to acquire and, and know that's happening. But if we choose a hotspot, uh, we can do different things with hotspots and kind of map out specific things. Um, sometimes there's a quest like, um, you know, I want to know you know, specifically where a user tapped on my banner. You know, one way to do that would be to make a bunch of, you know, small hotspots and um, make each one with, the, with its own custom track event. And then you could know if each, if you set up each one of these squares across the banner, you could know within this kind of uh, ratio here uh, exactly where they tapped. So you could then do unique uh, custom tracking for each one of these squares and basically, you know, map out the whole banner. 
so that would be great for um, just knowing exactly where a user is tapping. But also you could do something else. If I preview this, you'll see um, I have three different hotspots with three different shades of blue. And uh, the idea is that if the, the user is hovering their mouse over one of these separate hotspots, it's going to do something different. And you can see what I've done in the action line. I've basically um, nullified all of these other um, inputs because they're not necessary to me. The only thing that uh, I want to do is do a rotation. So uh, if you're not using this yet, make sure you do use this because this is, works really well for uh, responsive. Sometimes if you keep all of these inputs in here, um, it's going to make things kind of a little wonky because um, it's going to try and, and, and follow all of these directions. So in a case where you don't need all these directions and you only want to do one thing, such as rotate the button five degrees, you can nullify all of these. And then it's only going to do what, what you ask it to do, which is duration 300 milliseconds, rotate five degrees. So I have rotate five degrees on this one. On this one, I have rotate to zero. So sit, uh, sit basically uh, level and even. And then on this other one, I have rotate minus, which sends it kind of the other way. So if I go ahead and I preview this, you can see like very easily and quickly, I was able to do a kind of uh, a neat little hover state interaction. So um, this is you know a simplified idea, but you could do a lot more fun stuff with this. You could basically trigger off all kinds of different animations, or um, you know have things look pretty neat based on where the user is hovering. So um, if we move along, I'll show you some other little things that I was playing around inside this unit. So in this case, um, we're using just uh, simplified tap events. So these are all shapies. Uh, if you don't know already. Uh, obviously, you can apply actions and events to a hotspot, but you could also apply them to shapes or graphics and so forth. So you can see um, I have these these circular shapies, and I'm basically what I'm doing is um, when a user taps one of these, I'm asking for the the pan in the center to rotate and point to it, and then also show or hide a specific color shapey in the center. So if I preview this, I can go ahead and press. And now I have this kind of interesting kind of navigation system of just rotating this and uh, making a specific shapey appear. So just kind of giving you a feel for the tap events that you can kind of play around with different things. So you can also see this is a group. So I have two items inside of this group. I have uh, this kind of um, rectangular shape and then I have this circle. And since I'm grouping them together inside of one group, I'm able to treat it as one one item. So otherwise, before we had groups, you'd have to animate these kind of together and kind of try and make them animate in the same spaces, which was kind of a nightmare. But since we've got groups now, you're able to group things together and you can animate just by selecting the group. So if you look here, I'm animating this group, group seven. So it's animating everything together. So this is really good for if you're like animating cars or something, you're able to you know put wheels and a car into a single group, then animate the wheels to spin, and then move the whole group as a whole, which would move the car and the wheels together inside the same group. So you can really achieve a lot with groups. Uh, you can also use group for masking as well. So if I were inside of here and I wanted this shapey to be out of view and then animate into view, I could very easily do that as well from just animating the shapey from outside the group. So also um, something really neat here that I'd like to show you is this really cool slider bar. So I know that a lot of people, in some cases, you know, would like to have a slider bar, but are forced to use JavaScript. There's a really easy way to do this without JavaScript. And this is using our 360 component. So if you're familiar with a 360 component, uh, the 360 component is you, know, you upload a bunch of different frames that um, kind of play an animation. So if it was a car, for example, I think 360 is used for cars a lot. You would, you would show a photo uh, of a car, for example, you know, sideways and then on an angle and then straight forward and basically kind of like a flip book. You would play that. So in this case, um, using that same kind of idea, instead of using a car, we're just using this image that uh, we built out, which is uh, kind of like a, a timeline. And it has numbers underneath. And you have this sort of progress bar here. And you're just animating the bar going down the line. So each one of these frames is the progress of that bar going across. So once you've uploaded right here into this component, you can see in the, under my content panel, I have each one of these kind of built out one by one, it going across the bar. 
So now when the user kind of scrolls across this bar, they'll be able to move that little progress tab. So I'm gonna go ahead and save this and I'll preview it. So now I can just kind of swipe across this and you can see in between each number, uh, I'm hiding and then on each number, I'm showing the color of the number. So I can just kind of scroll across this very easily. So where all those actions live, again, is on the component itself. So if I open up my events and actions, you can see when this specific panel is in focus, for example, panel one, I'm gonna show shapey one, which if I show you here, shapey one is this one. I can show it to you now. You can see it's like this kind of uh, muddy color. And um, basically all I'm doing is on each panel in focus, I'm showing the shapey that is relevant to the number and I'm hiding everything else. So uh, I'll just kind of walk you through that there. So we have show shapey one, hide everything else. Then we go to our next panel. We're gonna do, uh, actually on the next panel, since I'm hiding everything, cause it's not on a number yet, I'm just hiding everything. And then on shapey three, I'm gonna show, um, or on item three, I'm gonna show shapey two, which is the red one. And I'm gonna show the red shapey two, I'm gonna hide everything else. And you can see that just kind of carries throughout um, all of these different panels. You can see that it's constantly changing. I'm showing one and hiding the rest. Showing one and hiding the rest across all of these. So uh, if I wanted to, I could also go ahead and uh, bring on a hotspot, for example. <clears throat> now, I don't know if a lot of people are using copy and pasting when it comes to animations, but it is definitely a lifesaver. So I want to make sure that I stress that to you guys. That you can do a lot with copying and pasting. So not just copying an item from one page to another, but also animations. So let's say for example, if I select this, I know that panel one is the behavior that I would like if someone tapped the number one. So if I bring this down right here over number one, I can go ahead and copy all of these animations by uh, shift selecting them all, command C or control C if you're on a PC. And basically what I did is I copied all these animations which, sh which says show shapey one and hide the rest. So if I paste it right onto this, it's a hotspot. It knows my first interaction is probably gonna be a click. So it's saying, hey, what would you like to do when someone clicks this hotspot? I can just go ahead and paste it. And now I basically have the exact same behavior if someone had uh, scrolled over to uh, one or if they tapped one. So now I can copy and paste this hotspot. So if I choose the hotspot, command, C, Command V. I can now hover over to my second one and I can just adjust this to show Shapey 2 and instead I'll hide Shapey 1. So just a couple of seconds and I basically, you know, duplicated a lot of uh, work that I did that was basically just going through here and uh, making sure the right shape is being shown. So if I save this now, I can go ahead and preview. You can see now I can hop very easily to number two by just choosing it. Uh, you can see that actually this didn't move to number two, so I could also uh, uh, animate this to move, to move to number two as well. So if we wanted to do that, we could go ahead and go to a component specific um, action and do go to item. So in this case, I would choose the 360 and then, uh, well, actually it looks like I'm not allowed to choose 360. Let's see, what would it be? Two panel. Well, that's interesting. For some reason doesn't allow me to choose 360. Sorry, I guess I can't do that that way. Let's see. Let's see if I can do next panel. Yeah, it doesn't allow me to do that. So that's interesting. Uh, when I was doing this before, it seemed like it was allowing me to do that. So let's see. My apologies, doesn't seem that that works that way. Show, hide. Let's 
Okay, well, I guess we'll move on from that. I know there's a way to do that. Unfortunately, it's not coming to me. Let me see if I choose this. It won't flip the 360. That's interesting. Okay, that's something I'll have to play with. Uh, let's just keep moving on. I want to show you how to um, animate uh, basically copy animation. So let's say I spent a lot of time doing a lot of really cool animations and I wanted to bring it to a different part of my unit or to an entirely different unit. So that's um, actually quite easy to do. So you can see, let's say I have this 360 uh, component and I have all of these panel and focuses here, which you know took me a good maybe 15 minutes to do. So I could shave off having to redo all of this if I were to just copy and paste it. So let's say if I copy this <clears throat> and I go to a completely other page such as here, and I shift paste it, you can see that I'm able to copy this along with all of the different, um, sorry, I would have to copy the other actions as well. So this actually shows you a good, good example. So when you copy and you paste something, I have all of these relationships built with showing and hiding those uh, colored backgrounds over the top, right? So when I copied it, since I didn't bring over the colored information or images rather, all of those relationships have broken. So if I go back and I choose all of these different um, background images that I'm showing, that I'm asking to appear, and I copy them as a whole, and then I paste them into the next uh, page, you'll see that these rela relationships maintain. So this is really good in case you're trying to like, for example, do a bunch of animations and then copy those animations to another page. If you don't carry over all of the graphics, those relationships break. So I'll give you an example. Um, let's go back here and let's say, I'm doing an animation here. And I'm basically animating this 360 um, component down at the bottom. And I'm going to say I want to animate it uh, one second. Let's say I'll animate to exactly where it is. So I'll drag this down as its start state. And then I'll say when this page appears, I want the 360 uh, kind of bar to appear, uh, animate to this position. And then I'll just kind of, I'm just gonna tweak this to say, let's say 201. So it animates up here and then animates back down. I'm gonna divide these animations with this time break and then I'm gonna do uh, an ease in, ease out. And then I'll do 500 and 200 for example. So the start state for this bar is down at the bottom. When the unit appears, I'm gonna animate this bar up to the top and then it's gonna kind of drop down a bit. So it kind of gives a little bounce effect. So I'll go ahead and preview this. So you see I get that little bounce effect there. So let's say I wanted to copy this to another page, right? So again, if I just select this bar and I copy it and I go to a new page and I paste it, you'll see all the relationships are broken here and also uh, the animations don't exist on the appear because I didn't bring them over. So if I instead uh, copy these animations, and I paste it here. You can see they're also broken because the thing that I was animating with is, no, is not on this page. So one way to do this, uh, which is a really good quick shortcut. Now I know this is just two lines of animations, but try and use your imagination and think that this was like a ton of animating we did, like you know, 15 lines of animations of some really cool stuff. And say there's multiple things involved, like for example, this, this bar is interacting with these color uh, background images. Uh, we want to make sure that all of it gets taken over to our other page or an entire different unit. So what I would do is I would copy all the animations involved and I would paste it to just one of the items to maintain the relationship. So in this case, uh, I can paste it right into this panel in focus. And now when I copy uh, all of these items together and I paste it to a new page, you'll see I can select the bar and my two animations for the panel in focus, looks like what did I get it on the wrong in focus. Hold on, let me see what line I, I parked it on. Okay, eight. So if we go over to eight, typically you'd want to do this a little more cleaner. So I put the two animations on frame eight. I can just go ahead and copy these off of frame eight. And I can delete them because they're not needed there. And I can go ahead and place them onto the appear of the stage. So this is just two lines of animations, but imagine there was like a ton of animations. You could basically copy all of the animations with all the graphics involved from one page to another by just kind of piggybacking uh, the animations onto the asset itself and then carrying the asset over to the new page or new unit so that way it maintains uh, the relationship.
because otherwise if you bring them separately basically what happens is those relationships will break so I hope that makes sense it, this definitely saves you a ton of time um, so definitely try and utilize it and like I said uh, if we go ahead and um, you know copy all of this here we can go from this unit to say a completely different unit such as this one and uh, paste it right in there and you can basically you know have all of your behaviors there still working so um, this this is really good when you're when you're dealing with multiple units or maybe uh, multiple updates across units you can basically uh, copy things very easily you could also copy entire pages for example so if you had one page uh, completely done and you have other units of the same size you could just copy that page select it on the timeline command C and then command V and you can see I can have multiple pages uh, from one unit and I can copy it into a completely different unit as well so I hope those copy and paste techniques make sense if there's any questions feel free to uh, drop that in the chat panel otherwise I'm gonna move on to dynamic Okay, so let's take a look uh, basically what's inside of these units. So this is our desktop unit and this is our, our mobile unit. So right away looking, you can see these little satellite icons here. And you can basically that tells you that there is something dynamic. There's a dynamic signal set up. So you can see there's a dynamic signal right here for audience. I can see that um, I have a default instance. I have the first among my friends to try new styles. Then I have a specific shoe for that. And I also have, um, you know, a mail asset for someone that um, likes to travel. And you can see uh, very quickly, just kind of hopping through these different instances by clicking on them, you know, what to expect. So here's a weather one where I'm showing a sunny background for a sunny day. For default, I'm showing also a sunny day. On a rainy day, I'm showing like a, a rainy overlay. And on a foggy day, I'm showing um, this foggy asset. So you're able to just kind of hop around and, and see how this is built. You can see I also have. Um, uh, message time of day so you can see I have a default messaging I have a 6 a.m. to um, noon which is start your morning fresh I have uh, a noon to late evening kind of messaging that says stressful day run through it and then I have a nighttime uh, messaging that says uh, winners don't sleep so you can see very quickly and easily you can um, kind of cater your messaging uh, based on different signals so this is really useful and I, I definitely recommend using dynamic anywhere that you can uh, because basically what you're doing is you're making the content more relevant to the user. The user's more, um, if it's more relevant to the user, the user is going to be more likely to engage with the unit. So I kind of want to show you really quickly how to set that up. So I'm going to start from the campaign level. Uh, two of our signals uh, that we work with, uh, placements and uh, audiences, are not built from with. I mean, they're built within the unit, but they're set up externally from uh, the campaign view. So um, in our campaign view, you can see we have our list out of all of our creatives here. But if we hop over to uh, the placement section, this is pretty much where um, you know, your media planners are setting up all the different placements. You can very easily create a new placement, and it doesn't have to be completely accurate. It could just be a placeholder for now. If you know that your team is basically going to be putting out these units that are going to run to like sports, uh, maybe some or you know, specific placements, you can go ahead and just put a, uh, a placeholder name for it for the time being. So let's say sports, for example, you could have um, this information again, doesn't need to be filled out. The most important is that you're putting a placement name for it so you know how to identify it from within the unit. So I'll just put sports for now and then uh, I wanna fix it to a specific creative. So in this case, I can do um, trem is the name of these units. So I'm just gonna use a desktop for now. So as soon as I click create, I've basically created a placement placeholder uh, sports that is tied to my trem desktop unit. So now when I go inside of my trem desktop unit, I'll see that this is now available to me. Um, I can go ahead and um, do another one, for example. Uh, we'll just do, uh, let's say, um, people who, uh, athletic people, athletic joggers, for example. I can go ahead and choose fix as well, and I'll go ahead and type in the unit uh, desktop again. I can create that. So now I have a sports kind of uh, placement and people who like to enjoy to jog. So that was very, you know, pretty straightforward for doing placements. 
I'll go ahead and now show you audiences. So our audiences, you can see I actually already have some set up. I'm gonna create some new ones though. So to create a new audience, you just hit the create new button. And here you can do a custom one. So if you had like um, your own third party audience data, you can just upload it here. Uh, you could also do language. So language is really good. Like if you wanna do English and Spanish or French, you can just select it from here. And this basically is detecting it at the device level and it knows the user's uh, device is set to these settings. So they know that they're an English speaker, for example, and you could adjust the creative based on that information. You could also use Newstar. So Newstar has like a really great a breakdown of all these different kind of target demographics that you can choose from. And uh, for example, if we wanted to, let's go ahead and do, let's say hobbies and interests. We'll say sports interest. Maybe they're, um, they're really into uh, college basketball. And you can see when it gets added, I can also an add an and statement uh, additionally to that to kind of piggyback onto that and basically you know, target and drill down even further. Um, again, we'll just do another one. So we have someone who likes uh, basketball. Maybe we'll also do someone who likes, let's say, tennis. There we go. So now we have our tennis and we have our basketball interest users and we know to look for these when we go inside of our unit. So from here, I'll go back to my creatives and I'll scroll down to my trim unit for desktop. I'll hop inside. So from here, all I have to do is select what I would like to make dynamic. So in some cases, you could choose just one thing. Like I could choose this hashtag, for example, that says hashtag run trim. I could also shift select and choose two items or more. I could choose multiple items. And basically, whatever I have selected at the moment, and then I choose my dynamic uh, content icon here, it's going to open up and ask me what kind of signal would I like to use for these items. And as soon as I choose one, you'll see that these two items just got bundled into a dynamic content um, nest, so to speak. So um, just, just as easy as that, I can make some really quick signals. So I'm gonna back out instead of using two, I'm just gonna use the hashtag for now. So if I choose just the hashtag and I add a signal to it, you can see now just the hashtag is nested in. So I can go ahead and choose an audience. So one, once I add a condition, you can now see I have a default condition and now I have an audience not selected. So all I have to do is choose what the signal will be. So here's my college basketball that I chose from my audience selection. And then you can see now this hashtag is inside of there. And then I could do another condition and I could do, for example, my tennis condition that I also chose. So as easy as that, I was able to really quickly make um, these multiple conditions. And you can see um, all I have to do is now adjust this uh, piece of creative so it's more relevant. So for example, I could do just, you know, kind of simply for an idea, run tennis. I could say, you know, run b-ball for example and you can see um, each of these conditions I have run trim for my default for basketball people that are interested in basketball you can see I have run b-ball and then for tennis interest I have run tennis so I know it's kind of a, a very simple um, example but just imagine there's you know you could do that with product shots you could do that with calls to action you can do that with you know multiple parts of your creative to make the creative more relevant to the user that's currently viewing it and again, making them more likely to engage with the user. And the name of the game is performance, so we wanna make sure that users are engaging it and hearing the story of the brand. So um, I'll go ahead and do another example. Instead of um, audiences, we can go ahead and choose placements as well. So again, uh, just add a condition. You can see those conditions previously since I turned off those conditions, it starts me back at default. I can add a condition such as, here's my athletic joggers. I can add that in there. I could also add another condition and I can choose my sports placement that I had, I had created. And as easy as that, you can basically create one unit that uh, is gonna kind of dynamically serve uh, based on the placement that you're serving, specific creative. So this is a really great way to kind of compile a bunch of different units that maybe are, are gonna have different placements going to different parts. Uh, of the wild out there and you can kind of just adjust the creative based on what placement is currently being served and adjust the creative. So instead of making like, you know, 50 different creatives for all different types of locations, for example, we could just go ahead and use dynamic um, content to adjust the creative and just use one unit. And so, you know, um, 
when you have multiple, like as you can see, I have several uh, dynamic conditions set up. So just because we have all these different kind of signals uh, doesn't mean it's loading all of that all of, all of that content. It's only going to load the, the 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 singular instance that's being pulled by what we're able to acquire at that time. So for example, if we have like a ton of different videos uh, for different placements, it's not going to make the unit really heavy. And it's not going to make the unit uh, load all those videos. It's only going to load the sing single video that's pulled in based on the signal. So here you can also see we have our, if we hop over to, let's say, let's do location. We can do like, for example, New York. So you can see it populates in there. You can add another condition such as San Francisco. And all I have to do again is just adjust the creative. So in this case, maybe this one would be like run SF for San Francisco. And I can do for this one, uh, run NY or NYC, for example. And when I save this and I preview it, all I have to do to um, see the, see the, con the, the dynamic content uh, in work, all I have to do is just choose the specific signal that I was working with, for example, location. I go ahead and type in New York, and if you look at the hashtag, it currently says the default, which is run trem. But if I uh, choose New York, you'll see that hashtag will now update and say run NYC. And if I also put in San Francisco, you'll see that hashtag now updates to run SF. So I can also show, show you the, um, the other conditions that are currently set up here. So we also have like a snowy day, I'm sorry, rainy day. <clears throat> So there we go, there's our rainy day background. We also have a foggy day as well. So um, see quite easily, you're able to adjust the creative uh, kind of on the fly. Are there any questions at this point for how dynamic content works? Feel free to drop anything in the chat panel. I'm definitely here to help you, so just let me know. So again, um, most of the signals that you're uh, working with, you can just go ahead and set them up from inside the unit. But again, the placements, you're gonna do at the campaign level as the media planner needs to set up the placements um, from the campaign uh, level. So you wanna do placements from there. Uh, so it's kind of set up externally, but again, you call it internally from inside the unit. And then audience is just the same. You have to go to the audience tab to set up your different audiences. And then you hop inside the unit and you can go ahead and, and pull in those different audiences that you set up to make dynamic. Everything else you can basically, these signals all work from within. So for time, you can go ahead and choose add a condition and choose the different uh, part of the day, day of the week or a specific date. Again, we did locations. You just type in the type of location you want to adjust the creative. You choose that location and then adjust it from here inside the nest. And then same thing with weather. You just choose um, specific weather uh, information and um, it'll basically populate. Um, basically, you can adjust based on these signals as well. And the last one is your uh, operating systems. So um, the different platforms. So if a user is using you know, a Windows phone or Android or um, OS uh, X for your iPhones and such, uh, you can adjust, for example, like a download button. Maybe for an iPhone user, you're going to show a download to iTunes store. And for an Android user, you'll show like a uh, download from Android Marketplace. So, okay. Uh, let me see. I have a couple questions. Okay. So I'm getting basically... Um, People are understanding how dynamic works, but they want to know a little bit more about how to animate with it. Perfect, that's definitely the next thing I want to hop into. So let's now leverage um, our dynamic signal and I'll show you how to do animations. So let's go ahead and open up our events and actions panel. Now, if you remember a little bit earlier on, I was talking about um, you know, how intelligent our events and actions panel is because it kind of updates itself based on what you have selected. So if I go to my layers panel, and I'm going to look at um, this instance that we set up. So uh, once I choose my dynamic content panel, uh, you can see I have my default, my New York, and my San Francisco. So in order to do animations with the graphics um, that are involved with the dynamic content, you would have to choose the actual um, signal itself. So once I choose a signal, for example, default, you can see the events and actions panel tells me, okay, what would you like to do when this condition has been met? So in this case, we can do a new action. We can do, um, yeah, the only events here are conditions met. So new actions such as animation, 
and we can go ahead and choose, for example, the item that's involved with the animation. Um, and it looks like you can also animate items from the outside. Um, so we could basically do all of our animations from a condition met. And uh, you I want to give one tip of advice. Um, make sure you do all of your animations on your default before choosing your other signals and setting up those signals. Because what happens is when you have all the animations set up on the default and then you choose a new signal, uh, those animations will carry over. So the default is kind of like the template. So um, if I do animations now, those animations won't carry over to my other instances. So I'll show you that now. So in this case, let's go ahead and, and animate the run trim hashtag. So when default is met, what would we like to do? We would like to animate, and we're going to animate this hashtag. And I'm going to turn off the width and height because uh, I'm not concerned with that. Um, and I'll, I'll keep the X, or I'll keep the Y rather, and then I'll make this half a second, so 500 milliseconds. And then just for fun, I know this is kind of silly, but I'm going to just do a 360 degree turn for it. I'm going to ease it out. So this is where my animation lives for the run trim. Now all I have to do is um, select the start state for this, so how it initially appears. So I'm going to have it initially appear lower. So let's say right around where the CTA is, and I'm going to turn it to zero opacity so it's not visible. So its start state is obviously where it currently sits, and then its end state is when it gets called to do its animation, which will be on this condition met, and it will do a 360 and kind of hop up. So if I save this and I preview, um, I will have to turn um, my location condition to default. So not available would be default. We're not able to obtain the user's location or they're not sharing it with us. So it would be no, not available. And then we'll get our default instance, which was that 360, it kind of animating upwards. So if I go and I look at my other conditions, you'll see that those animations are not there. Um, now again, I could, like I showed you before, I could copy this animation. I could paste it to the hashtag itself. That way it retains um, its information. Or I could just, um, you know, I could delete these conditions and start again. Now I know this is only one animation, but imagine you did like, you know, 15 animations here. It's going to be a real pain in the neck to redo all those animations for the other instances. So um, what I could do is I could just pretty much just trash these. Now if I add a new condition and I type in New York, you'll see that animation now carries over. So you can see the animation now exists here. So before it didn't exist here because I did it after the fact. So again, really big tip when you're doing lots of animating uh, for your dynamic content uh, creative, make sure that you start on your default first before making your signals and then um, animate all of the items involved. We're lucky here because this is just one piece of uh, texty component. But let's say there was four different items inside of this condition that were going to be dynamic for this specific signal, and maybe each one was animated. You want to make sure that you do the default one first, and then uh, when you create the new signals, all of those animations will carry over. In this case, it's just a single animation, but you know, nevertheless, you know, it's something that you want to carry over. Uh, and again, if it doesn't carry over, if you had already created all the signals and customized everything the way you want it to look, you could always just reanimate it, and hopefully, you don't have too many animations to redo. Um, so now if I preview this, I'm just going to adjust the run trim to say um, run NY. So I'm going to turn the opacity back on so I can see what I'm doing. So in this case, it's going to say run NYC. And then I will drop it back down to where it was, opacity to zero. And now it should give me the same animation, which is condition met animate up, run NYC. Okay. So now from here, if I go ahead and I choose um, a location and I type in New York, I'll get the run NYC hashtag animating up the way that I asked it to do. Uh, does that make sense for um, animating? If there's any questions about um, animating, let me know. Cool. So yeah, I know I did kind of a simple example. I'm just animating a hashtag, but let's say like, you know, this product shot animated in and you had all these different animations, just make sure that um, you're kind of setting up those animations first on the default. So that way when you come back and you adjust all of those different creatives, you don't have to redo the animations. So that'll definitely save you some good amount of time. Uh, just reading through a couple questions. Let me see here.
So I'm seeing that um, someone's having trouble with um, basically resetting all of the elements uh, for kind of like a replay effect. Um, yeah, so for that kind of, um, it depends on the duration of the animation, but I do come across this from time to time, which is basically you have a bunch of animations going on and you want to be able to replay it all from start. I think the best way to do that, um, and one reason why people are having trouble with replaying is the animations tend to be too long. So let me put it this way. If you have an animation that's lasting many seconds and the user taps replay before those animations complete, what happens is that the, anim the, the graphic is being asked to do something and then all of a sudden gets asked to do the same thing again. So what, what that causes is kind of like a hiccup in kind of like the scripting, I guess you could say, where the graphic is being asked to do more than one thing at once. So the best way to avoid that and to get a, a true replay to happen is to make sure that the animations are you know, short and sweet as they always should be since we have very limited time with our users. Uh, we wanna make sure that they're engaged so you wanna make everything you know, quick and exciting. So just make sure your animations don't last too long and don't let the replay uh, animation button appear until those animations are finished. Once those animations are finished, then you can ask those pieces of graphics to do something again, those, the, the, that, those pieces of content. So number one is making sure that the animation completes itself before asking it to do something again. The second thing would be to reset all of those animations to their square one, so to speak. So one quick way to do that that I like to do is I'll, I'll do, for example, um, I'll do a custom action set, and then under custom action set, I'll call for a reset. And then what I'll do is I'll just choose all of those animations involved that I need to reset. And typically those, those items will already be in the position that I want them to be since that's where they start off at. So I'll just choose all of those different um, items and select them and I'll make all of them happen. I'm just gonna do an example like this. This is clearly um, you know, just for demonstration. I'll do duration zero so it happens instantly. And I'll make sure that they go back to exactly where they're supposed to be. So on um, the button, when I choose my button to reset, let's say that this button right here, uh, let's just say that this button says reset, just for argument's sake. What I'll do is on the reset button, I'll first go to my custom action set, choose my reset. So again, reset from custom actions is basically turning everything instantly at zero duration back to where they're supposed to be. And then once that's done, I'll carry out the typical animation that would happen. So this first, reset everything back to where it's supposed to be. Once that's done, so I'm making sure I'm dividing this, I'll then go back to the um, specific animations that I want to replay. And that way, any anytime anyone clicks this button, the first thing everything does is I trigger my reset, which is putting everything back to square one, and then I ask it to animate again. But again, if these animations are still occurring when someone hits reset, you're basically telling one piece of uh, graphic content to do more than one thing at once, and that's when you're gonna cause a glitch. So just make sure that those animations don't last too long or that this reset button does not appear to them until those animations have been complete. And then with that formula, you should be A-OK. -okay. Uh, so I'm getting a question about um, animating between mobile and desktop. So absolutely, um, the only thing our animation capabilities from with our, within our platform are basically across all of our products. Um, you're able to always you know, an, animate in similar fashions. And um, the only thing that you're gonna run across are the different events that are available to you. So as I kind of stressed before, um, the main different events you'll see is, um, like for example, on a button, you'll get a hover state for desktop and also click. Whereas for uh, a touch device like handset or tablet, you'll get a tap event and you will not get hover or mouse out, for example. So as far as the animations go, you'll be able to animate exactly the same. Um, for dynamic content, these conditions that exist, uh, condition met and how we're animating here on the desktop unit, you'll also be able to do so on a, a mobile unit as well. So I'll hop over to the mobile unit to make sure that you can see that. So if I go over to this mobile unit, I can see that I have this message, right? This messaging here at the top. So if I choose the messaging, I can see I have a condition met just like on desktop. And I can also do an animation. I can choose what I want to animate. So in this case, let's say I want to animate this copy. And I can, let's just say in half a second, I'm going to rotate it 360. 
and save that. I can preview. And now when my default messaging is displayed for my handset unit, it's an interscroller, so we kind of have to like scroll through here. You can see, um, sorry, that might have appeared too quickly. Let me just scroll down a little quicker. You can see my 360 um, title kind of rotates there. So also, if you saw, like um, when I scrolled, I scrolled a little too slow. So if you ever need to put um, kind of a delay, just put a wait there. So if I put a wait here and I do like a one second wait, save that, you can preview. And that way, as I'm animating through it or scrolling through it, it gives me a nice little one second delay there. So yeah, animating between desktop and handset uh, de uh, devices, you won't find much difference there as far as animations go. Um, Again, the only big difference is what you're gonna what you're gonna see here in events. So here you can see my events. I have mouse over and out only applicable for desktop. So I hope that makes sense. Cool. So uh, we have a little bit of time, so I'd like to just walk you through really quickly of how to set up a, a reveal unit. So let's go ahead and hop over. Uh, well, let's start here at my page here. So over here to set up a our reveal unit so our review reveal unit is kind of think of it like uh, a standard banner right uh, standard expandable banner but it, it offers a lot more value because what it does it kind of gives you this kind of splash animation so I'm going to show you this uh, preview this Aspen um, unit I'm not sure if anyone's seen this before but basically you can see it starts off as a banner with an animation and then it goes back to a banner so that's pretty neat because um, what it's doing is it's taking the standard banner and grabbing more attention it's 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 uh, it's kind of like if you ever designed, um, you know, websites. They kind of, there was like, you know, you want to do like a splash animation in the beginning just to kind of grab user attention to kind of hopefully get them to engage. So that's kind of what the reveal unit does. It's basically doing a splash animation of some cool stuff going on to to really grab the user's eye and, and be like, hey, what's going on over there? And then they can see whether they want to interact or not and, and expand. So in this case, you know, from here you would just expand, and it would give you that full unit. So I want to kind of uh, show you really quickly how to set that up. So um, this product, um, this feature, or format rather, is part of Rich Media Display. You can go ahead and choose Reveal. You can see it shows you the splash animation screen. Then it shows you it goes back to a banner, and then it goes to full expanded. So um, here you can choose the type of device you would like to run that on. And then you can choose the type of unit size. So in this case, it's kind of really up to you. Um, you can change this later. Um, so really. Um, it's up to you. I think uh, if we just hit next, we'll just say reveal sample a unit. So once you're inside the unit, I'll show you, you can adjust those, but I kind of just want to show you what's going on here. So it makes good sense. So from here, um, if you look at your info panel, it's going to tell you about the reveal unit. So you can see we have an intro of hundred. So the intro is basically where the, in the animation takes place. So right now we have it centered. If I put it down at the bottom, you can see my 100 pixel intro height from the bottom is from here to here. So that top blue line, my grid guideline, is showing me where this animation should live. So technically, you shouldn't be anim animating outside of this because this is like your viewable area. It's making sure that this will always be viewable. So if I change this, let's say, to 150, you'll see that top line now raises. So now my viewable space is this whole 150. And when it collapses, it goes back down to 50. So 50 is pretty much your standard, you know, 320 by 50 or 300 by 50. So this is pretty run of the mill. You'll want to keep it at 50. But for your intro height, it's kind of up to you or where the ad is serving. So in this case, we could have it, um, you know, 150. And then uh, once it expands, it will go to a 320 by 400 size, which again, you could also adjust. So now hopping over to the Aspen unit to show you so it makes a little sense here. Uh, you can see my banner where all the assets kind of uh, go down and contract to or collapse to rather. You can see it's within this 50 pixel height. And then my full animation of when uh, the mountains come up and the skier goes across the screen is up to this uh, 150 blue line. So aside from just kind of understanding the way um, these guidelines are here to help you, you can see if I move it to the middle, my 50 banner pixels now the center, my 150 is now the outer. And then if I go to the top, you kind of have the same thing where the banner collapses to the top 50 pixels and the full uh, intro animation is down here to the 150. So you can adjust that quite easily. Um, the other thing that you want to know is, um, I think that's pretty straightforward, but the other thing that you want to know is um, 
the resize unit action. So what happens with the resize unit action is basically you're telling the user or the unit rather where the user currently is within the experience. So on the first appear, we want the user to be in the intro part of the experience. So you can see I have an intro, I have a collapse, which would be the banner, and then I can either do a maximum or full screen, which would be when the user expands. So you always want to do the resize action and let the user know or let the unit know where the user currently is. So when the unit first appears, I want the user to be in the intro, which is uh, when all of these intro animations trigger off. So if I go to my custom action sets and I look at my intro animations, you can see you know, the, the mount image slides up, I have the, the, the skier goes across the screen, and then finally the mount image goes back down, and then I'm telling the, the unit that I now want it to resize to the clap state, which is down here. So that basically just allows the viewable area to kind of adjust itself with these resize units. So again, when the unit first appears, show the intro state, which is this, this larger line with the intro animations. And then when my animations play off, what I'm doing at the end of my animation saying, okay, my animations are done. Let's go ahead and collapse down to the banner. I do a resize collapse. Now, when we want to get to my expanded part of the unit, you can see if the user taps here, I'm sending the user to my expanded page, which is a separate page where I have my creative built out for the expanded. And the first thing I'm doing is I'm resizing to full screen. So as long as you can remember to use those resize um, actions, you'll, you'll get the behavior that you want for the reveal, uh, which is really great because again, you're getting a cool splash animation. You're making the banner um, kind of uh, take up more uh, space on the screen. So it's more uh, attention grabbing. And then it collapses to your standard banner, uh, what users are, are um, you know, comfortable with the, um, interacting with. They know what to expect from expandable banner. Uh, again, if you're ever kind of like playing around on your own, you're like, oh, you know, what did Julio say about using those resize actions? You know, hop over to support.seltzer.com and there are guides literally for everything. So if I type in reveal here, you can see I have an article about reveal. I have how to build with the reveal format. If I click this, it's going to give you a step-by-step a -step guide. Here's a QR code you can scan to experience it on your phone. You can see um, how it works, how the intro height is with the animations, goes back to the collapse state. And then once the user taps, it goes to the full experience. And step-by-step, -step, it's gonna tell you, you know, what to expect and how to build properly uh, for this specific format. Um, Again, you know, our support site is so robust. It literally has so much stuff going on. Like if you want to learn how to build uh, inline video, you know, there's articles here again. There's also guides. It shows you how to use cue points. Um, so specific parts of the, of the inline video, maybe I want to show, um, you know, cer certain animations happening, like this, this overlay of this image. You know, I'm using cue points to animate that into view. Um, so... Uh, definitely leverage the support site. Another really good thing I like to show is our keyboard shortcuts. So um, everyone knows the command S to save and the command Z to undo. That's very like, uh, you know, secondhand like Photoshop. We know like what to expect there, but there's a ton of other shortcuts that maybe you do not know, like redo or uh, copy selected items we know, but um, maybe we don't know select all items or deselect all items or invert selections. Invert selections, great, you know, definitely use that a lot. So, um, you know, check out keyboard shortcuts and just overall, you know, use a support site. It's got so much there. Uh, the only other site, uh, part of our page that I go to a lot, it would be our seltzer.com slash insights. And this is where you would go to just basically check out um, our ad gallery, see the latest ads that are being built. You can break it down by ad format. You can break it down by specific device or industry. And uh, it has all these great examples here for you. So if you just click on one, it gives you kind of this, um, this video that you can watch and kind of brainstorm and, and kind of figure out what, what, what kind of cool animations you can do with uh, Seltra and how to leverage uh, our features. So this is super useful as well. So I'll just let this play through. So here it's just showing you the experience. So this is our outstream video. You can see it um, kind of slides into view, pushing the publisher content out of the way. You can see our countdown here at the top so the user knows you know, how long they expect the video to last. That way they're more likely to stick around and watch it. And you can see it has these cool, crisp retina um, uh, copy overlay, and then your final call to action there at the bottom. And then of course to dismiss, you kind of just roll the publisher content uh, back over.
So pretty cool. Also, um, from here you can, um, like I showed in the beginning of the of our session, you can access our webinars. You can also see our case studies. Uh, you can see also our reports. We put here our benchmarking if you want to learn more about spe specific industries that are running the most right now and what kind of features are getting the best engagement. Uh, definitely go through all of these uh, different sections within our insights page. Again, that's seltzer.com slash insights. Thanks a lot for everyone that joined today. Um, feel free to reach out, support at seltzer.com. If you have any questions uh, specifically, uh, definitely here to help. Um, definitely happy building and uh, enjoy these tricks and tips. Hopefully um, they help you out. Otherwise, I'll see you at the next webinar. Have a good one, guys.